In this presentation, we're going to discuss various topics in marine ecology. So fundamentally, marine ecology is the scientific study of marine life habitat, populations of species, and interactions among organisms and their surrounding environment. This includes their interactions with both abiotic or non-living physical and chemical factors, as well as biotic factors, which constitute living things. There's a variety of different ecology subcategories. So when we talk about marine ecology or ecology in general, oftentimes people find, or ecologists find themselves in one of these core categories. So let's just touch on what all of these are because all of these different subdisciplines are involved in the, process, in the whole concept or topic of marine ecology. First, we have physiological ecology, which studies the impact of biotic and abiotic factors on organisms and their ability to adapt to the environment. Next, we have behavioral, behavioral ecology. In this particular discipline or subdiscipline, um, ecological and evolutionary dynamics that relate to adaptations in organisms are often the focus. Population ecology deals with species-specific studies and deals specifically with a group or a population within um, a certain habitat or, or biome and how, those, how that population interacts with the environment. Community ecology looks at how species species interact with each other within a habitat or within a community. Landscape ecology is the study of how organisms adapt to a specific landscape, and this tends to be more terrestrial focused. However, there are some interesting and kind of new and budding um, landscape ecology applications that are being applied to marine environments. Ecosystem ecology is really more of a macro look at, a, at an ecosystem and looks at how energy and matter flow through that particular ecosystem. And finally, global ecology is the study of how energy and matter interact with the entire web of life throughout the earth. So super macro scale. So in digging into this whole concept of an ecosystem, an ecosystem can be defined as a community and the interactions between the biotic or the living elements or factors, and the abiotic or non-living factor um, that are in a defined or particular area. All ecosystems have an interaction between the abiotic and biotic components. They all require a constant input of energy, which as you can imagine is uh, going to be largely kind of fueled by the sun. Although in some of these kind of deep deep sea environments you could uh, that could constitute hydrothermal vents or something along those lines as the source of constant energy. There's a cycling of chemical and nutrients also that occur within ecosystems. So this particular figure gives you an idea of how a coastal ecosystem is going to be divided and also gives us a, the ability to discuss ecosystems along the coast because of the fact that we can define something called the continental shelf, which is a shallower region that um, is where the land and the sea meet and falls just before something called the continental slope, which is going to be a deep, kind of steep portion of the, um, of the seafloor that is going to eventually get down to this trench area or to uh, the continental, or sorry, the seafloor. Um, you eventually get to, with these, with these different environments, you can kind of break them up uh, horizontally in addition to kind of vertically there. At the top, we have an epipelagic region of the ocean or epipelagic environment. Just below that, oh, sorry, I should mention also um, that this epipelagic kind of uh, slice of the ocean here is going to be an area where a lot of light is going to be able to... Um, be accessible to planktonic organisms and tends to be quite shallow. The mesopelagic region of the ocean is going to be the region just below that where only some amount of light will get through. The aphotic range here in the bathypelagic kind of range of the ocean depths is going to be between a thousand and four thousand meters 
Um, so it's a really, really wide range. And in this region, we call it aphotic because of the fact that there's not going to be any light that can really get through to these to this depth, um, even within this mesopelagic range, which falls between about 200 meters and 1,000 meters, uh, that that progressively drops off in terms of the amount of light that can that can uh, go to the 1,000 meter mark there. And then um, at the 4,000 meter mark down to um, really only the trenches, you have this ab abyssopelagic uh, kind of range here. And this is going to be where there's definitely going to be no light whatsoever, as you can imagine. Um, and we tend to use the word the word abyssal to refer to that, or the abyss. So that's this very deep parts of the ocean. So we have these different types of environments that are occurring. Uh, another, another element that I, I didn't mention earlier is that as you have this continental shelf portion here, the bit of the ocean that corresponds to the end of that continental shelf all the way to the interaction of the, the uh, land and the sea there at the shore, we call this the neuritic province or the neuritic zone sometimes. Um, within that, you can find regions of the uh, intertidal region that we, that we can refer to as sub, superlittoral, the littoral zone, the sublittoral zone, and uh, so on and so forth. So we have a lot of different describers that we can use in order to break down and better describe the kind of embedded or nested ecosystems within a particular region such as along the continental shelf there. So in the pelagic realm, in the kind of oceanic realm here, uh, this just gives us another idea of what kind of organisms are found within those regions. So just along the, along the shoreline, you'll have your, your inner tidal zone. But in the pelagic realm, or the mostly underwater, or completely underwater portion of uh, our oceans and along our coastal environments, we see that we have uh, some of these seaweed species as well as phytoplankton and zooplankton that are going to live within that photic zone um, because of the fact that they're going to be requiring light in order to exist so they have to be in those shallower regions. You also find things like jellyfish and some of the species that prey on those particular uh, types of organisms uh, along the top there. I don't have it in this figure but you would also find dolphins and seals and sea lions and all that that require air in order to live. Uh, as you get deeper along the continental slope there, we find a different variety of sponges and sea pens and sea spiders, and crabs and sea stars and octopus and all that, that progressively kind of have these, these different tolerances to uh, not only temperature, but also seawater pressure. As you can imagine, as you get deeper into this water column, there's more and more you know, water that's kind of on top of or <laughs> above you. So some of these organisms are gonna need special adaptations to manage that and deal with that. Additionally, as you get progressively deeper, there are um, further adaptations in these organisms to deal with things like a lack of any v uh, light within a habitat. So um, we're all pretty familiar with this little anglerfish guy who has a little light, a little photoreceptor on the end of his, I forget what you call that stalk there. Um, that allows him to attract different species to that light so that he can, you know, prey upon them. So uh, there's a variety of different adaptations for dealing with the lack of light, higher seawater pressure above them, uh, lower, you know, lower temperatures, higher salinities, things along those lines. So there's different types of marine ecosystems. And remember, a marine ecosystem is going to be anything where there's an interaction uh, where there's a large body of water and there's some kind of, tends to be some kind of interaction with the sea. So even the ones that we may consider more terrestrial environments, such as the salt marsh, is actually going to be considered a marine ecosystem because of the fact that it does have a connection to the sea. So we have salt marshes here. Another example would be an estuary. There is a little bit of a difference there. It's a bit more of a, uh, which we go into at a later talk. Uh, we have lagoons, which are again kind of another uh, another term that's mixed in between estuary and, and sometimes with salt marshes, and uh, we'll, we'll again discuss that in a little bit later. Uh, the intertidal zone, 
mangroves, which are going to be very special in that they have specially adapted plants for kind of inhabiting those zones, regions, coral reefs, and deep sea and seafloor environments. So we have quite a few different uh, marine ecosystems that, that an individual could study as a marine ecologist and specialize in. Now, let's take a look at trophic pyramids and trophic levels. So a trophic pyramid is basically a graphical representation of biomass at different hierarchical, hierarchical levels. Trophic levels tend to be consist of organisms that share the same function in a food chain and uh, the same nutritional relationship to the primary sources of energy. So let's take a little bit closer look into that. Um, so in this particular figure, we have a trophic pyramid. And at each of these trophic levels, one, two, three, four, five, six, we have increasing levels of consumption across the organisms, such that the trophic level at the bottom, these primary producers here, are going to be organisms that are um, photosynthetic, so they're going to obtain energy from the sun. There's a large kind of volume or large abundance of these organisms, uh, and they are going to be preyed upon by the organisms at this secondary level here. Once you get to the next level, you find organisms that are um, we refer, refer to as first level carnivorous consumers. So instead of preying upon the primary producers such as plankton, they're gonna prey upon those herbivorous consumers. So they're gonna prey upon those uh, shellfish organisms, the uh, bivalves and all that, that had ingested the zooplankton and seaweed and whatnot. There are going to be, so, there's going to be some overlap, so you will find some kind of um, what we call uh, omnivores that can feed upon both the primary producers as well as uh, any of these particular herbivorous consumers. Uh, but large in part, they're going to feed on the organisms found at the secondary level. On the level above that, you have secondary level carnivorous consumers that are going to predominantly feed on first level carnivorous consumers. Just above that, as you can imagine, we have third level carnivorous consumers. Um, and they are gonna feed upon the ones at the second level and sometimes the first level. And then at the, uh, at the uh, top of our pyramid here, this is oftentimes term termed apex predators or top carnivores. And that consists of organisms such as sharks, dolphins, and um, seabirds. They're going to basically going to be the ones that are feeding on this third level carnivorous consumers typically. Now at each of these different levels, you are going to have contributions to the decomposition, right? So these organisms all die. Uh, they're broken down by decomposers. Um, and there's always gonna be a, an energy loss, a heat energy loss that occurs at each of these levels. So, um, Energy input is going to be largely, like I said, from the sun, and you end up with heat loss at each level. So you can use this different trophic pyramid as well as, um, as different kind of parameters or whatnot associated with energetic uh, uh, consumption at each level in order to work out what energy is available on the secondary level, on the next level up. So... I think I mentioned all of that. Oh, also detritus is going to be matter from dead or decaying organisms or waste that eventually becomes dissolved and is worked into things like the nitrogen and carbon cycle again. So um, just to mention, it is important to note that there are limiting resources that can be um, studied or evaluated for marine ecosystems. Uh, we've kind of touched on this before, but those limiting nutrients or resources, sorry, are going to be resources that cause a population to reach a, a pivotal point where it can no longer kind of increase. So at each of those different levels, you have these limiting resources that are going to be responsible for the abundance of organisms at the trophic levels. That includes things like nutrient, nutrients such as nitrogen or phosphorus, the availability of light. So remember, we've only got light available in that very small photic zone or that small zone at the top, um, and then it becomes drastically reduces. So if you're a planktonic or organism, you're largely going to need to, you know, you're going to be limited to that space at the top of the ocean. Space, it's kind of the same thing, right, for an ocean habitat. 
Um, but space maybe along a coastal environment, such as on a coral reef or along in a tide pool, can be a limiting factor. Dissolved oxygen or carbon dioxide can be a limiting factor, and so can be and so can uh, inorganic compounds. So, oops, sorry about that. As we take a look at this uh, figure here, it's a little bit blurry, but as we have uh, time on the axis and consumption on the y-axis, you have this carrying capacity or this um, limit to the number of organisms at each trophic level. In this particular figure, we have another thing that is important to understand in terms of the marine ecology and the use of marine habitats uh, by organisms. So oftentimes, despite the fact that there might be a lot of space available, uh, there's going to be an optimal range and a tolerance range for these organisms. And that corresponds to things like temperature or pH level or things along those lines. So there are temperature ranges wherein if it gets too cold or too hot, an organism it becomes a habitat that is unavailable to that organism. Um, so there's a preferred niche and then there's this marginal niche where things are starting to get a little bit challenging physiologically for that organism to kind of maintain and exist within a habitat. So despite that fact that we have these large ocean kind of, they look like there's a ton of space and there's a, a large amount of, you know, unending space available, there are these abiotic factors, pH level and temperature and the availability of carbon and all the rest of it, that's going to actually reduce the amount of space within those open ocean environments or even those kind of coastal continental shelf environments um, that are acceptable or useful for marine organisms. So it's oftentimes we think about with ecology, we think about a forest, right? You've got a forest with five trees in it and 10 bushes and it can only support a certain number of organisms because of the fact that they need a tree to live in and this, that, and the other. The ocean is much more, I guess, abstract <laughs> because of the fact that we do, it seem, it's seeming as if there is a large amount of space available, but really you have these factors that are underlying that create those different marine habitats. Uh, again, we need to kind of reemphasize the fact that we have energy flow that occurs within these habitats, and that can be another element that's important for their survival and for the important to the interactions of these organisms and their habitat. So first off, we kind of mentioned this in, with respect to the, um, to the transfer of energy from the primary producers. Now we have this kind of flipped around, right? So we have our, our third level consumers at the bottom here and our primary producers at the top because we're kind of focusing on the injection of energy here from the sun. So you can actually work through, there's energetic models where you can work through the energy, pro energy production and consumption. Um, and over here on the very bottom, we see what these, these colors correspond to. So the light blue is gross pro productivity and the, like the tan peach color is net productivity. So with these primary producers, for example, they have a gross productivity of 20,000 in this particular example, a little over 20,000 kilocals uh, per meter squared per year, right, that they can produce. However, they have to use some of that energy in their own biological functions. So after all that energy is left, within their, you know, physical structures and lost to heat, we have this, oh, actually, no, heat is lost from that blue gross productivity. So... Ignore what I said about that. So after the heat loss, we end up with um, with this this seven just a little over seven thousand kilocals that are available to the next level of consumers. Um, some of that is lost to decomposition, so the organism's not going to completely break down its structure, um, meaning some of it will be retained within the structures of the organism. But some of those organisms are going to get consumed, and that. Consumption will result in a gross productivity of a little, little over 3,000 kilocals per meter squared per year for primary consumers. So as you make your, make your way down this chain, you see the gross, primary, pri, sorry, gross productivity that is available to these, these different level organisms. But then they need to kind of work with that in their own. They have to work in their own biological function. So they're only really going to output a certain amount that's available to the next level. 
So as we go down this list, you can see that there's a smaller and smaller amount of energy that's available to those tertiary consumers, which is going to uh, control how much and what abundance of, of food those organisms are going to need to ingest. We have another way of looking at it here um, in terms of you know, phytoplankton and the, the amount of energy loss or percentage energy loss and efficiency at these different trophic levels. As you can see, when it gets to the trophic level five, so we're one of the apex predators here, then we're going to run it into some limitations with respect to what, how much energy we're going to get out of these organisms. So you can see why food waste is a big deal. Right? Um, and then finally, we have this recycling of nutrients within the ocean that's going to impact all of this, that's going to impact the amount of zooplankton and phytoplankton that can be kind of controlled or generated and uh, that can grow within a habitat. Um, we see that in low nutrient supply with efficient recycling, there's actually a good 90% nutrient regeneration that can occur here. But when there's a high nutrient supply and inefficient recycling in a system, it basically ends up with a, um, a much smaller amount of uh, nutrient regeneration occurring within the water column. And so there's going to be a lower amount of this net primer, primary productivity happening, and a large amount of this uh, organic matter is just going to end up sinking to the bottom. So in the left-hand side, we have a slow net supply of new nutrients. On the far right-hand side, we have a rapid supply of, net, of new, nutri new nutrients into the system, but they're not being cycled through the system very well. So you are limited in terms of the trophic level um, based on the organic matter that's floating around within the oceans and through these different nutrient pumps. Finally, within marine ecology, it's important to understand species interactions. And we'll just touch on three of the most commonly kind of studied ones, which are competition, predator-prey interactions, and symbiosis. So competition can occur with intraspecific organisms or organisms that compete with members of their own species, or it can occur with interspecific organisms, which are individuals of different species that compete for the same resource, such as food, shelter, or space. So there's two types of competition happening. Uh, there's one couple different possible outcomes. One outcome is that uh, one individual excludes the other, meaning they're going to succeed and the other will fail and possibly die out or need to move. And we call this competitive exclusion. Or another possible outcome is that they coexist. And you end up with something called resource partitioning, which is where organisms that feed on the same thing and need the similar habitat are going to kind of organize themselves into these small niches or small regions within a larger habitat. Oh, sorry, I should mention too that this is an example of that uh, where you've got these series of birds that are kind of distributing themselves at certain spaces along this very, uh, very shallow portion or this very small portion of a coastal environment. They will only feed in those regions. So niches are the specific area where the organism inhabit, inhabits. Uh, animals tend to evolve to fill niches. And if, oh, sorry, if two species cannot fill the same niche, then competitive exclusion will occur, and one of them will get kicked out or will die off. Uh, so one outcome is that the two species evolve differences, or one species goes extinct. So one way they can evolve differences is potentially by uh, having certain adaptations that become favorable over others. There's something called the fundamental niche, which is all the possible resources that are available to a species in a habitat. We also find something called the realized niche, which is all resources a species actually uses in a habitat. Um, so as an example, eel river rainbow trout have a fundamental niche that includes all the pools, all the riffles, which are little water elements surrounding these deep water pools, um, in the aquatic and, uh, and all aquatic and terrestrial insects. However, only aquatic insects are those that um, they prefer to 
eat. And the riffles are regions that they occupy when predatory, predatory pike minnows are present. So they're really going to only exist within the riffles and consuming these aquatic insects, um, which really means their realized niche is quite smaller. Similar to what we were talking about in terms of tolerances, their, the space that they occupy is going to be quite smaller. Predation is where one species, a predator, kills another, a prey, for food. And we're quite familiar with these. Um, there's some ways that organisms can kind of fend off predators. They can have a warning color that says, hey, if you eat me, you're going to die because I'm poisonous. They also can have camouflage. This is one of our favorite things to learn as a kid, right? Spot the camouflage organism. Here we have a weedy sea dragon or a sea dragon which uh, at our San Diego Birch Aquarium, we have a great uh, sea dragon display. Um, and then we have a halibut, or I think it's a halibut down here, uh, that's camouflaged and kind of blending in with the seafloor. Symbiosis is a close and prolonged interaction between organisms of different species. And symbiosis is important because it can allow for a couple different relationships. First, there's a relationship of mutualism, which is where both species benefit. So in this particular example of moray eels and a cleaner wrasse, uh, or a clownfish and an anemone, both of the organisms are getting something. This cleaner wrasse is getting food because it's feeding off of little food bits along the outside of this particular eel, and the eel is getting a place uh, to, or getting itself kind of cleaned off there. Uh, commensalism is where one species benefits and, and there's no apparent effect on the other. So an example is a titan triggerfish, but actually we'll skip that example because here we have a gray whale and a barnacle. The barnacle is getting a safe space to live. However, the gray whale is not really benefiting from this. And in fact, these can become um, a bit bothersome over time to the whales. You can see them kind of splashing and trying to shake them off, we think. Um, and finally, parasitism occurs when one species benefits and the other is harmed. So tapeworms in the gut of a whale or any organism. Uh, in this example, we have an isopod, which is this little guy here. Uh, isopod crustacean is attached itself to this fish and ultimately can result in the fish dying. So there's a couple different ways to look at relationships between organisms in marine ecology. And that sums up my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.